Chandrika, it's an absolute delight to be with you together again. And congratulations on your most recent uh, album, Amu's Treasures. Uh, four years ago, uh, we spoke about your journey in Jivoham. Could you talk to and speak to how the con concept of Amu's Treasures came about? I believe your uh, grandchildren were the inspiration for Amu's Treasures. Yes, and uh, it's very interesting that you speak about Shivoham the Quest. Shivoham the Quest was an oratorio expressing my journey from sort of the late 90s, early 2000s to 2000, sort of the early 2020. And that was a journey of my finding myself. And I'd also said that, that as you find yourself, you're able to share more of yourself. You're able to uh, give more of yourself. And I had that great opportunity when my first little grandson came along. Um, and so Amu's Treasures began as a series of songs that I sang for him and then extended to my other grandson, which I just did as bedtime routines with them. And, and how did they respond uh, uh, in terms of, and, and the fact that you were inspired uh, to go ahead and go with this very comprehensive album of many, many songs. Uh, not necessarily uh, children's songs, but also other songs which, which made them also go ahead and uh, sing along with you. Right, so before that I have to tell you, yeah. what is Amu? Yeah. Amu means happiness, Amu means purity, Amu means joy. And it's a term, it's like a delicious term of endearment. Yeah. That's what my grandchildren call me. I could have chosen to have them call me Pati or Amama, but I chose that they would call me Amu. This is before they were born. Now, so every time they would ask me for a song. So the journey started because when the boy was very little, my Kavi, the oldest grandson, I would just sing him to sleep. And then he would all automatically fall asleep in no time. In fact, whatever time of day it was, whether he had just woken up and just had a feed, he would be asleep. Within, within a few minutes, his entire body would relax and he'd fall asleep. And then I decided, you know, coming, being a grandmother, I should be giving him some of the old Vedic chants. So I would start with little chants and he would listen and listen. And then as he got older, when I, I'm saying older, which is six months to eight months to 10 months, he wanted more. He'd want more and he wouldn't stop. If I stopped singing, he'd start crying. So then I started to do so many songs and it grew to a point when around two years old, when he was about two years old, the bedtime routine sometimes was two hours long. And because he wanted more, the first thing he would do is if I was singing one song, he would ask for the same song nine or 10 times. And, but then I had to go in and write on my phone, what additional songs do I remember? So I went very quickly away from Vedic chants into Ashgrove, Sarangani, and Teddy Bear's Picnic, and Woodpecker's Song, and all the songs that gave me so much joy as a child. I was intrigued, and as a Sri Lankan, I was delighted, ecstatic, because you sang those two singer songs, Surangani and Portadisicaria, which are very, very popular bailas in Sri Lanka. How did that come about and how did you uh, sort of memorize the lyrics to sing those two songs? You know, when we sung songs, when you and I sang songs and you were in a band yeah. when you were yes. younger, I don't forget a single lyric, do you? No, no. No, yeah. so I didn't need to memorize anything. When I was little, Surangani in my college was like a happy song. We sang it, the boys sang it more than the girls. Of course, they sang it with some some sort of Roger questionable words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I decided to change it for the boys. I ch decided to make them tender. I brought in the grandmother. I brought in love. and so. There was no question of my forgetting the songs. I was just simply looking for songs that made me happy. And what made me happy? Songs from so many parts of the world. Suragini made me happy when I was in college. When I just joined college, I was 14 years old, Madras Christian College. Suragini was all the rage. On a cool summer morning was in Madras Christian College. Songs like Ashgrove, Miller of the Dee, were songs I did at Holy Angels Convent way, way back when I was two, three, no, I'm not two, three. Uh, second grade, for so whatever, five, six. And in fact, one song on the album, Now's the Time for Planting Seeds, is a really interesting one because uh, I was in second grade, but it was my first week of second grade and they picked me to do the solo line with 20 boys. 
So they were all the gardeners and I had to go around and my mother got a blue frock and I remember she sat up half the night making a yellow basket with fake flowers. So I could go around like standing in the garden singing, now's the time for planting seeds. That's the only time I've ever sang it. But when my grandsons wanted a new song, one day I picked out, now's the time for planting seeds. But that's how our memories work. And then I added another verse to it because I thought the song was too short. And as you, as it was initially conceptualized as an inspiration from your grandchildren, uh, you have described it as a hug to the world. And uh, you then had, uh, the, you went to Prague, there was a choir there. Uh, can you speak to that and then also uh, speak to your performances at the World Culture Festival uh, on the Washington Mall? So this whole album has been an incredible evolutionary journey. So stage one, like I have these grandchildren, I'm singing to them every night. My, my uh, sort of my uh, um, voice gets tired after a while. There's are two hours I'm singing and then, then I think to myself, what if I'm not around? I should just leave something for them. That's exactly how Amos Treasure started. So step two, I said, I got a couple of musicians. We went to a beautiful location called Mass Mocha and we recorded for two days, nothing else. We just sat and uh, we had a pianist, I had a guitarist and a drummer and I had my trusty tampura and we just sang one song after another, nonstop. Morning, not 10 o'clock until 10 o'clock at night. We finished the whole album. Now, the, the end of the second or third day, we were, the third day, we were all listening and said, one guy said, you know, Shandrika, if we could only have a cello on this, Molly Malone would sound so much more beautiful. Then somebody said, well, you know, this is calling for a banjo. Why don't we see if we can get so-and-so? Let's get Bella Fleck. Let's get Eugene Friesen. Every and I musician. You got a piano accordion too. And a piano. Of course, Kenny Warner had worked with me many times. So these are maestros. These are masters. So each one came together, invited by other musicians. So Jamie had called up some of these musicians and said, you want to do this. And they called up all of these people and that's how the album grew. So once it grew, every one of these masters, these maestros, brought their tenderest emotions to the music. And I'm going to tell you a quote that Eugene Friesen, the cellist, who's, he said, Chandrika, I've played for 67 years or something like that. He said, I've played in churches, I've played everywhere. Never have I played Teddy Bear's Picnic in a studio and never have I had so much fun doing it. I think that's the spirit. Everybody brought their most beautiful, tender self to this album. And how did the idea of this massive choirs of children uh, singing uh, favorites like Que Sera, Que Sera, and, uh, and also uh, the songs like uh, Where Have All the Flowers Gone? Right. How did that emerge in the whole uh, aura of this uh, concept? So the first part is just all of these songs now, 35 yeah. songs yeah. I started out with. And by the way, for these 35 songs, I have another 50 songs that aren't on this album. Mm -hmm. So that's stage one. Now, we sent a friend of mine had taken a raw draft of the album to a refugee center in Prague which is called the Kroki Dobra, where 200 uh, refugee families from Ukraine are being housed to help them through the trauma. So my friend thought, look, wouldn't it be, I know your album's not ready, but why don't we just send them a few songs, they're sweet little songs, they might enjoy singing them. I said, sure, thinking nothing of it. No one spoke English, by the way. They were all non-English speaking. And young children, you know. So then they called me and said, well, would you come in and do a concert with us, with the children? I thought to myself, what, 30 children, you know, it's a, it's a refugee center, it's not a big deal, we'll just go sing with the children. Those children, suddenly I started to get little videos from these children, they couldn't speak English, but they say, Chantika, and then they would show me K Sarasara, their practice sessions of K Sarasara. It was so sweet, you know. But then the, uh, the Lobkowitz Palace, which is a beautiful palace in Prague, offered us the space. So we ended up performing with the children. I had two rehearsals with them in Prague. They had already been rehearsing and as children danced the songs, I created movements for them and they sang it. And it was a very joyous moment. But the most sweet moment of it all was at the very end, the uh, children drew a picture of Amu. Each one had been spending like weeks coloring pictures of Amu. So when I turned to the audience and sang Ke Sera Sera with the children, and I turned around to kind of look at them. All the children pulled out their pictures of Amu 
and stood in the line and, and I just wept because this was such a such a beautiful way that they were giving back and expressing their love. So there were many, many moments of poignant, tender emotions. And your performance uh, with uh, several choirs at the Washington Mall, uh, the Art of Living Foundation, uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar's annual uh, concert that was done. How, how did that impact on you? How did it affect you? Because these were hundreds of thousands of people on the mall. So I had opened both the World Culture Festivals. I've sung the invocation for both the first World Culture Festival in Berlin, yeah. in the Olympia Stadium. And again, there, Sri Sri basically told me, oh, why don't you involve a few people in singing? So what happened there is that I ended up just teaching people. And then before I knew it, a hundred people from Argentina would join the choir. And another 200 people from some other country would join the choir because they were all in Berlin. We, I couldn't accommodate all of them. But they all ended up singing anyway. We did a couple of very short songs, which I could only, because uh, they had to make it do with limited practice. Yeah. Fast forward to this, Shishi had asked me uh, several months ago, he said, you should do the uh, invocation, do, and he came, and I'd come up with these other ideas of one day mantram and so on. And he said, sing with lots of people. So that was the instruction. And a wonderful woman in DC, spoke to a couple of the choir directors, we sent them the songs that I had composed for this, and they were very excited to practice. So we had 250 high school kids. Yes, Walt Whitman High School. Walt Whitman and Clarksdale High School, both had practiced incredibly well, you know, and then they came together. So I went to Washington for several hours, I practiced with them. But what was fun is, you know, when I walked into the rehearsal hall to practice, just for the first practice session, the children started screaming. I could have been Michael Jackson yes. <laughs> or whatever. And I was stunned because I'm saying to myself, I'm this, I'm, I'm not anything really. I'm not an iconic celebrity. I mean, why are they cheering so much? Because they discovered this music in themselves. Yes. So the joy came from that. And I think that's really what this is all about. That's what Amos Treasures is about. So music gives them the joy, singing in groups in this very joyful way. They learned, they learned Sarva Mangalam Bhavatu Bhavatu Bhavatu. You know how difficult it is to pronounce it in the pure Sanskrit way? You know how difficult it is to pronounce Vande Mataram, Vande Mataram. Yeah. There's two different things and they all work so hard. We got it almost right. And I think that's, that's what I think everybody enjoyed. And then I took them through Indian scales. You know, because each of the songs had Indian pieces and they had Western pieces because I'd written them both together. And and and, uh, and the most beautiful thing is they sang this with, uh, I'm going to cry talking about it, they sang this with, with fervence, I mean, with, with such fervent emotions, with such a dedication. We explained the songs. Why are you singing Sarva Mangalam Bhavatu? You're singing because you want to bless the planet, you want your family, yourself, your friends, your family, everybody to have Sarva Mangala, your mind, Jiva Mangalam, Atma Mangalam, Mano Mangalam. Chandrika, could you sing a part of a track from Amu's Treasures? Sure. So I'll sing you a song called On a Cool Summer Morning, a bit of that anyway. It, the full song is in the tra album and it's a song which we sang in school, in school and college. Great. On a good summer morning On a good summer morning Went a girl for a walking On a good summer morning Went a girl for a walking Companion and she was a lucky So she started sweating and sweating and I will tell you how Take this cupid bow I will tell you how, how Satan is Cupid's bow.
and uh, later this month uh, you go to India and uh, uh, segueing in terms of your philanthropic work, uh, Madras Christian College, you are one of the only two of only uh, distinguished lifetime awardees, uh, the other being TN Station. Can you speak to that? And I'm sure Amu's treasures are also going to be messaged out in India while you are there. Could you speak to uh, first uh, what you uh, uh, want to do with Amu's treasures while you are in India and also what you are going to be doing at Madras Christian College in terms of the philanthropic work you're doing there and continue to do? Madras Christian College <coughs> is one of, was one of the happy places of my life. I spent three years there. It's a great college. It's a wonderful set of friends, wonderful set of teachers. I enjoyed myself and I learned a lot about myself being there. And I wanted to give back. So when they made me distinguished alumnus, I decided to give a gift. Surprisingly, a few years later, I found out that they had created a business school mm -hmm. in with, with named after me, actually not named after me. It was really named after Boyd. It's the Boyd Tandon School of Business and Boyd, was the founder of Madras Christian College. And when I was very little, my grandfather went to Madras Christian College. I grew up on stories about Boyd and McPhail, who are the two founders. So when they unveiled the plaque, which was a big surprise to me, I, I, they did this about 10 years ago. I literally was in shock. I said, what is this? They said, oh, this is the plaque. This is the foundation stone, because we're about to build a business school for Madras Christian College. And that's going to be called the Boyd Tandon School of Business. That's what happened, which was an, I mean, it was an incredible gift that the college gave me. Fast forward, we've now got, we've come together, uh, we've got an advisory group, we've hired two deans, we're about to start a major business program at the college. And the other wonderful thing about this is that many of the people that have come together as the advisory council for this college are many of my classmates from IIM Ahmedabad. In fact, and that's it's it's sort of coming together of different nodes of my life, and then some of these one or two are involved with Madras Christian or alumni. Many of them aren't. Many of them just want to come together because they are they've all been incredibly successful in the business world, and they want to come back because they want to do something. It's it's a bond of friendship. It's a gift of friendship to each other, and we've also had a blast working together all of us trying to dream about what is the possibility that we can create in this college. One is a dean of a college or a business school here, one of the top business schools here. One was a chairman of NASCOM, you know, so he's very big in so Mittal is a, Gopal is maybe was a chairman of one of the largest companies in India. Sajeev Thomas is an alum who I, who's now the chair of the board of, the, of this thing. So many, many more people will come together. We, we have got that small. So this college will open. It's already, the building is up. We've got the AICT approvals. We've got two amazing deans that are going to be there. And I think the first courses will happen um, in the spring or early summer of next year. And back here in New York, uh, besides <coughs> the Tandon School of Engineering, which you have endowed and has been around for the last few decades, you also have a new project with the NYU. Can you speak to that? I believe some buildings have been acquired and uh, it's on the verge of a launch. Well, it's really a broader, <coughs> it's really expanding the science and technology footprint of NYU. And, and I think this is a critical issue for our school and for NYU in the science and tech space. Because my mission, as I look at where I want to engage, I kind of define it in two ways. Economic empowerment, through science and technology and emotional empowerment through music. You know, we can all do many things. I can boil the ocean, but I'm focused on a couple of thimbles, you know, just trying to boil those thimbles somewhat well. And those are my fairly narrow fo foci, foca, focal points. So the economic empowerment gets into science and technology. So we are going to be expanding the school and we've done it in many ways. We've already, you know, the school was not ranked very high 12 years ago, and now it's one of the top schools. We have just signed major memorandum of understanding with the Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, which is called the Massachusetts MIT of, of Korea, and with IIT Kanpur and a couple of other IITs. We just did that during the Modi visit. So we, NYU is a global network university, so KAIST has now got a place at NYU Tandon, IIT will have a place here and vice versa. So I just think we're going to be expanding the science and technology footprint. The reason I care a lot about this is 
20 years ago, science and technology wasn't that relevant. Now, even the arts and the music industry have been completely transformed by science and technology. We can't afford to have it be a bystander. It has, it's an imperative. It has to be integrated. Otherwise, we're going to lose generations of kids. We've already lost generations yeah. of older people. Mm -hmm. And we, we've, got to, we've got to come at this with, with uh, a very, very uh, clear and hard and purposeful set of initiatives. And that's what we're about. And finally, at a philosophical level, over the years that I've known you, you've been driven, whether it be business, whether it be philanthropy and now music. Uh, uh, I know the life is short and uh, maybe all of us probably have uh, maybe if hundreds of years, at least hundreds of hours left. How do you encapsulate all that with all the passion and drive that you have in terms of doing what you want to do? Look, it's about, in, it's about creating an intentional path. It's about creating an intentional plan for yourself. Very often, you sleepwalk through it. You don't even know the, like my 20s passed. I didn't know they had passed because I didn't see the light of day. Yes, I made a lot of money. I was very successful. But there were whole aspects of myself that were ignored. So my epiphany, my spiritual awakening, if you like, 20 years ago, was the greatest gift the universe gave me. So now I'm, yeah, there's some things I, I have days when I just waste my time, but I'm very clear about what I'm going to do. Because I do want to be able to say at the end of each day, if today were the very last, I'm okay with that. It's, I've done exactly what I wanted to do. In, in, in broad strokes, yeah, I mean, I would, if I was dying, if I knew I was going to be dying in an hour, I would definitely want to give my grandkids and my kids a hug. But, but other than that, at the broadest strokes, there's nothing I would do differently. Uh, you could have kept Amu's treasures within the family because it started, that's the way it all started. Why did you feel that it was something that had to be shared with the world? To start with, when we created Amos Treasures, the kind of majesty of the album with the 17 maestros coming together and putting their absolute best efforts. I mean, Bella Fleck, who is the greatest banjo master in the world, took this and played seven tracks. And he played some, a song like, he played a song like Kukubara, and he's played it with such joie de vivre. Okay. Yes, it's beautiful. And, and then we've spent hours and hours on production. So the whole album's made, been made to the highest levels of production quality compared to the best of the best, because we had inc incredible people working on it. Having done that, the whole vision then became, why would we just not want every children to experience that hug? Why don't I want you, you were talking about your grand nephews and grand nieces, if you could have that album, could you not share that? And so that you could sing Kukubara. These are songs that are part of our oh, connection yeah. and our childhood. Now, maybe it's not Kukubara, maybe somebody else comes from a different tradition, but, but perhaps that will inspire them to sing the songs to their grandchildren. I'll tell you a story. Uh, the engineer, when we were recording this song, uh, we just finished, I just finished singing Teddy Best Picnic in the studio. And he said, oh my God, this is the most beautiful version of Teddy Best Picnic I've said. The next morning he said to me, he has a six-year-old son and his wife had just passed away. And he said, I want to tell you, you know, I've been wifeless for the last three years and I've been not sure how to put my child to bed. Mm -hmm. But he said, for the first time, you gave me the, you gave me the strength to, yeah. to sing. Yeah. And he says, I've been singing Kookaburra and Teddy Bear's Picnic. He says, I'm not a great singer, but I've just been singing. And now I'm thinking I'm going to have your album and I'm going to be singing with him. I'm going to tell you one more story. And this is, this was about children, right? The other is when I played it to a very, very senior woman, and she's a terrific, she's a big artist, and she's, a, she's not a musician, but she's an artist. She's a leads of major institution in one of the universities. We were sitting at Canyon Ranch in Lenox, Massachusetts, and she said, oh, what's your new project? I said, I've got this. So I just played one, she had, I had my headphones, and she put it on. And she literally had tears pouring down. And if you knew her, she's, I don't think I've we've been friends for a long time. I've never seen her cry. And then she said, I said, what was going on? What, what happened? And then she said, I wish my mother had sung to me this way. And in the podcast that I've done, two podcasts that I've done, both women have told me, you know, doggy in the window, my granddad used to sing that to me. And then she had a different way that her granddad sang, sang it to her. 
that's what I want. This is about intergenerational love. This is about sharing. This is about opening your heart out. And if I can open my heart out, okay, I have some musical talents, but everybody has so many talents. And who cares? The children can't yeah. tell a note from the other. Yes. Let's all sing it together and give a hug. Yeah. So that's why I call it Amu has a hug for the world. Amu has a song for everyone. And Amu's door is always open. I'm Amu. You are Amu. We're all Amu. And we've all had an Amu in our lives. Absolutely. And I just want us to find that Amu. Thank you very much, Ida. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Andrew.